Okay. All right, sounds good. Well, hey everybody, thanks for coming to my Beacon talk. Um, I'm Bryce Taylor, I'm a postdoc with Maitreya Dunham at University of Washington. And uh, I'm gonna share some experiences from designing teaching labs using uh, yeast experimental evolution in the classroom. So the basic paradigm to my research is understanding how my favorite yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, has adapted to a, a wide variety of environments. So cerevisiae, maybe the oldest, one of the oldest domesticated organisms, um, certainly one of man's best friends for a long time. Uh, they're involved in making beer, bread, coffee, cheese. Um, we currently use them to make fuels like ethanol uh, and our a lot of experiments using them in synthetic biology context to make next generation fuels and medicines. Um, they've been a workhorse in molecular biology. So at this point, they're maybe the most well characterized organism on the planet, uh, at least at the genetic level. Um, and uh, they're uh, distantly related, but still have a lot of genes in common with pathogenic species of fungi like Candida albicans or Candida auris. Um, that are growing global um, health problems as they become resistant to antifungals. So there are a lot of different lines that we can take to study cerevisiae and its evolution, um, and a lot of different impacts that can have on different uh, fields of biology and on just human health and livelihood in general. So over the last few years, I've been taking this basic experimental evolution paradigm and working with a, a team on a project that we call YEVO. Um, a whole lot of people have been involved in this project, and I'm just showing a few people here um, uh, who've been particularly key in the process um, over the years, uh, and many of them will come up throughout the talk. Um, and the basic paradigm uh, in mind with YEVO is to develop collaborative education partnerships, where we as researchers are partnering with teachers to figure out where the intersection is between our research interests and their teaching interests, um, so that we can then develop lab exercises that they can do with their students uh, in the classroom that's going to um, uh, get the students involved in an authentic research experience and generate data that then feeds back into those research goals that we're interested in. Um, so uh, this project, uh, um, uh, Maitreya Dunham is a uh, PI in my lab. She's been key in developing it. Uh, Paul Rowley and Josie Boyer at University of Idaho have been uh, our for, first sort of YEVO franchise, they've taken the protocols and really run with them and done some incredible things implementing in schools in Idaho. Um, Alexa Warwick of Beacon uh, has been um, uh, working with us to evaluate the education side of this and make sure that um, the uh, experience is really a positive one for students and that they're meeting learning objectives and uh, things like that. Um, and then Ryan Scopammer uh, kind of had the initial idea for this. He's a teacher down in Pasadena um, who had this idea to develop a lab for his high school classroom um, that would use yeast evolution, that would have opportunities to connect genotype to phenotype in an evolutionary context so that throughout the uh, term of his AP bio class, um, they could uh, take a, a single yeast evolution experiment, but tie it into many different learning objectives um, that true to the real research process, there'd be opportunities for um, the students to have agency in their experiments, to uh, make decisions, to have ownership over the process, um, and also just on a, a fun level to collaborate with each other and also compete on some level. And I'll get into some elements of that. The basic paradigm of these experiments is that students uh, take a yeast, they inoculate it into a, a test tube of liquid yeast media, um, and we uh, add something to that media called a stressor. This is some environmental factor that's gonna slow the growth of yeast, and we're particularly interested in stressors that are relevant to some of these um, either domestication or human health processes uh, that I mentioned up front. Um, so this could be something like uh, changing the salt concentration of media, which is relevant to baking, uh, or adding an antifungal, which is relevant to um, drug resistance processes and, and distantly related pathogenic yeasts. Um, so over time, they propagate yeast in this uh, stressful environment. And as rare mutations occur that uh, have a benefit in the environment, they'll be selected to a higher frequency. 
um, and over time the population will change. Um, we chose to work with a, a stressor called clotrimazole. This is an antifungal drug that um, uh, I'll get into in a moment. Um, the particular yeast that uh, the students work with are engineered to express vibrant pigments. These were made in uh, Jeff Buka's lab at New York University. Um, they carry uh, some pigment production genes on a plasmid. The plasmid uh, has a, a marker for drug resistance, so we can add a drug to the media. Uh, it both keeps the colors around and keeps bad other microbes from getting into the culture and contaminating it. And we can also watch the colors over time to make sure that the students haven't experienced a contamination ex uh, event. Um, the colors also allow us to do a basic lineage tracking. So we can take two different evolved lineages of different colors, mix them together in that stressful environment, uh, and then plate and count colony forming units of each color to get a sense of which one has, has reached a higher fitness. So this is one of those opportunities for um, competition that I mentioned that uh, has led to uh, many a, a yeast madness bracket in the spring where um, students uh, uh, compete to see who reached the highest fitness in their evolved yeast. Um, it also allows us to do some uh, kind of fun side projects like uh, using yeast art as a way to introduce sterile technique and working with um, plates, which it, it, when you're just learning, it's surprisingly complicated. It's very easy to gouge that auger. So anyways, uh, the students carry out this evolution experiment. Um, at the end of it, uh, uh, I take clones from their experiments and sequence them using a uh, whole genome Illumina technology. Um, I identify mutations that have occurred during their experiments and send back a lightly curated list so the students can um, carry out a literature search to uh, figure out what these genes do um, and then we can together start to build some models of how the function of those genes relates to the uh, drug resistance phenotype that we're selecting for. So after uh, a few weeks, uh, in this case seven weeks, um, you start to see some uh, divergence between lineages. So uh, this is just a, a few test tubes. Um, on the left side, two tubes of an evolved strain and on the right, the ancestor. Uh, in two different doses of the clotrimazole. Um, you can see that the, uh, in the higher dose, the ancestor is quite peakish. You can basically see through the media, whereas the left three are much more opaque. Um, so this evolved strain is clearly doing much better in a, a high dose of the antifungal than the ancestor. Um, one benefit of working with this drug resistance phenotype is that the mechanisms of how these work is very well established. Um, so this is a model that a, a student in our lab, Margot Walson, developed um, after doing a, a literature survey. Um, there's a lot going on here, but it, it gives us some opportunity to uh, contextualize what mutations might be doing. So clotrimazole, when it enters the cell, uh, it inhibits an essential process by um, uh, impairing the function of this gene ERG11, which is involved in making ergosterol, which is uh, basically the yeast analog to cholesterol. It's a critical cell membrane component. Um, and that drug can be removed by a pump called PDR5. Um, this pump is in turn regulated by some transcription factors, uh, PDR1 and 3. And frequently students will end up with mutations that either lead to increased activity of ERG11, so you're compensating for that inhibition, uh, or increased activity of these transcription factors, which ultimately means more drug getting pumped out of the cell. Um, so even though there's a lot going on here, and if you dig into the literature, it gets way crazier, um, there's still a, a pretty straightforward story that uh, most yeasts are either pumping more drug out or dealing with the inhibition in some way by bolstering this pathway down here. So just to jump through some of the uh, mutation data that we've gotten from these experiments, um, I want to start with a, a group C from uh, 2017 to 2018 school year. Um, we sequenced a couple time points from their experiments. They kept this experiment going throughout the whole school year. Um, the first clone we sequenced from group C had a mutation in this gene PDR1. Um, after the uh, longer period of evolution, we took out a second clone from their experiment. Uh, this one has a mutation called a petite, which is a, um, 
uh, loss of the mitochondrial genome that ultimately leads to uh, increased activity of these transcription factors. Um, and if I add in uh, the remainder of the clones that we sequence from that first school year, uh, the thing I want to highlight is that every single clone has at least one mutation um, that just fits directly onto that model. Um, but these aren't the only mutations that these clones have. They've got uh, a bunch of other uh, mutations. And if we look across all the experiments we've done, we can start to look for um, new resistance factors that haven't been characterized before. Uh, and at this point, we've sequenced uh, 99 clones from these experiments. Um, so we've got a, a pretty good sample size at this point. Um, so this table is uh, a list of all of the enriched mutations from our experiments, which I defined as uh, at least three unique mutation events um, uh, across all of these clones, um, just based on a basic statistical test for how often you expect things to happen multiple times at random. Um, it's kind of an overwhelming table to just look at, but I want to just highlight a couple things. Uh, first off, if you look at the function of these genes, you see a lot of themes uh, that relate back to that um, uh, model that I showed earlier. So we've got a lot of regulation of this drug pump. We've got some stuff to do with ergosterol, which is that pathway that's inhibited. Um, we've got some mitochondrial factors, which is related to that um, petite phenotype I mentioned. Um, and on the right, I've added a couple columns for uh, if anyone has seen uh, evidence that this particular gene impacts azole resistance, or if anyone's found uh, that the pathway this gene functions in impacts azole resistance. So kind of reassuringly to me, most of these things are yes in both columns. So those are sort of like the positive controls in this. Um, but we've got a few things that pop out um, that uh, have some no's. So for instance, one that I'm excited about, um, there's a mRNA degradation pathway um, in a, an organelle called the processing body. Um, individual factors in this uh, pathway have been shown to impact azole resistance, but the pathway itself has not been implicated. So I think the, uh, in addition to these two uh, there are a few other factors that have one or two mutations um, that are in this pathway that um, I think when we look at this body of data as a whole, it probably highlights that this um, pathway has more uh, has an underappreciated role in this uh, very well-studied phenotype. Uh, and then even more excitingly to me is a gene of unknown function, CSF1, um, that again has not been implicated in azole resistance. So uh, this was a first target that I was interested in um, checking out uh, uh, whether it actually has an impact or if this was just luck that it happened to get um, hit many times by mutation. Um, so I did a, a CRISPR experiment where I took a wild type strain um, and introduced one of our evolved mutations uh, into that strain using CRISPR-Cas9 um, as a I'm going to show a few different uh, genotypes by cartoon over the next couple of slides. Um, Non-synonymous is going to refer to this star, which represents the, the mutation that occurred in our um, evolution experiments. And then the square is a synonymous mutation that's just like a CRISPR control. I wanted to make sure that the, the process of um, zapping these guys with CRISPR didn't um, uh, have some off-target effects. So I introduce a secondary mutation that should be silent. Um, I took the wild type synonymous and then a, a strain with both the synonymous and the non-synonymous mutation and mixed them together. Um, I grew them for several generations in media that either um, just plain YPD or YPD with the uh, azole added. At the end of that, um, I Sanger sequenced the pools, and then I look to see whether um, the frequency of this non-synonymous mutation has changed over the course of the experiment. Um, so on the Sanger sequencing peaks, um, hard to see on this screen, but I'm going to quantify it in one second. Um, We've got uh, these two little uh, overlapping peaks are the non-synonymous and the synonymous mutation. So initially, they're both present. Um, at the end of the YPD condition, you can see they're both there. Um, but if we look at the YPD plus fungicure um, 
uh, both the wild type alleles have just totally disappeared. Um, and if I quantify this using a, a program called QSV Analyzer, um, and see that in the fungicure condition, that non-synonymous mutation has just totally fixed, whereas it, it doesn't seem to change in a significant way in the YPD condition. Um, so this is our, our confirmation that this gene actually is playing a role in azole resistance um, on its own. So as a next step, I'm, I'm excited to um, dig into the function of this gene and try to figure out what it's doing to uh, uh, play a role in this process. Um, like I said, it, it's uh, largely uncharacterized. It's known that um, mutations in it have some impact on fermentation. So it could be that it's shifting metabolism um, uh, more towards fermentation, which would relieve this uh, repression from uh, uh, on these transcription factors. Um, there's also mutants that impact uh, protein maturation in the endoplasmic reticulum. So maybe somehow it's impacting um, uh, ERG-11 function or something else going on in the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, but this is something that we can test with some straightforward yeast assays where we'll um, do things like epistasis analysis and some basic uh, biochemistry to look at whether these mutations impact uh, ergosterol production, for instance, um, and see if we can actually figure out what this is doing. So going forward with these experiments, I'm kind of excited just to see um, as we find these new factors that play a role, um, some of these could end up proving to be uh, uh, druggable targets, or they might just help us to, to better understand the basic biology of this pretty well-studied phenotype. Um, and, and either way, I'm kind of excited to just contribute to that process. Um, this last year with the pandemic, obviously we haven't really been able to do a lot in class. Um, so last summer, uh, my lab and I developed a, um, uh, just a, a basic evolving at home protocol. Um, uh, several of my lab mates um, took home kits where they uh, carried out some evolution experiments um, at home and a, a grad student in our department, Sai Gorgifard, uh, made some really nice um, visual protocols to accompany them. Um, we uh, switched up the selection pressure. So we were using all natural um, environments, things like uh, uh, hydrolysate is a, a biofuel feedstock. Uh, tea tree oil uh, surprisingly inhibits the TCA cycle. Who knew? Um, it has antifungal activity. Um, and then caffeine, um, which also is, uh, has antifungal activity. Um, uh, we started out doing this just with a lab strain, but have since modified it to use um, uh, the Fleischmann's baker's yeast. So we've got a, a non-GMO yeast um, that we can put in these kits. The caffeine experiments are the, the one I want to focus on for a moment. Um, so caffeine uh, inhibits a signaling pathway called TOR, which is a, a conserved nutrient sensing pathway. It's present in humans. Um, uh, dysregulation of TOR is a common um, cause or contributor to cancer progression. And so there's a lot of interest in uh, understanding how uh, TOR inhibitors work and how resistance to them evolves. Um, and after five weeks of evolution with this at-home kit, um, our, our uh, uh, beta testers started to see evidence that their yeasts were becoming more resistant to the caffeine exposure. Uh, and when I sequenced clones from their experiments, we saw um, several mutations that either are in genes uh, involved in nutrient sensing or in regulation of that TOR pathway. Um, so this gives us some uh, hope that this, um, uh, as we build this out with more replicates, we'll start to see if we can find some new interesting information about um, TOR regulation based on this. Um, but one thing that I thought was kind of exciting in the, the interim um, is that we're also getting a bunch of mutations in that same detoxification pathway that comes out with the azole. So the PDR1 mutations, the petite mutations, uh, super common in these experiments. And so I think that uh, this opens up the possibility of a kind of natural experiment in pedagogy going forward, where we've got these two different protocols, very different framing. I mean, we, with caffeine, obviously, we have the translational potential, but um, we can also talk about food science since uh, yeast are involved in fermenting coffee beans. 
Uh, maybe this is relevant to their environment out in nature in some places. With the clotrimazole, we've got our um, medical application. Um, but when you do the evolution experiment, the end result is uh, going to be basically the same for most students, where they're going to get these same mutations that lead to um, overexpression of these drug pumps and help them to get drugs out of the cell. Um, so effectively, if two different classrooms or individual students within the same classroom take on both of these protocols, um, the framing of the activity is the only thing that's really differing. Um, so I think it'll be kind of interesting to follow up and see if that, um, wh whether a student identifies with a particular framing or if they just think it's interesting, um, if that has any impact on um, uh, what they take away from this activity and things like um, uh, how they talk about um, terms related to our learning objectives at the end. So that uh, ends the first part of the talk. I'm gonna try to uh, go through one more section um, but I just wanted to end by um, reiterating this idea of trying to develop collaborative educational partnerships. Um, I think this has been a really uh, interesting project to be a part of over the last few years. Um, and I want to highlight that it's both been really interesting for me as a researcher, because I'm thinking through these problems in a different light than I, I used to before I, I was doing work like this. Um, and I also think it's been um, useful for our teachers. Um, I hope that they come away from this feeling kind of empowered to try something new with their students um, and to learn a bit more about some of these modern biology tools that, um, uh, that are available, particularly in the yeast community. So I'm now gonna hop into uh, a very different trajectory that um, I'm kind of interested to get some feedback from this group on. Um, so yeast uh, display many interesting phenotypes. So I've focused so far on uh, drug resistance, essentially. Um, but you, know, you can select on anything. Um, so uh, one phenotype that I have found really fascinating over the years is the ability of yeast to um, uh, stick to things. So we tend to think about microbes uh, it's going from a, when they're growing on a solid surface, they go from a single cell to a little colony. Um, but many microbes, in, including yeast, can express these sticky proteins that allow them to either form structured colonies um, or to stick to the surface uh, and form a biofilm or to um, uh, grow in a polar fashion and form filaments, which is particularly relevant to fungi. Uh, in liquid media, expression of these sticky proteins can lead to um, phenotypes like flocculation or um, uh, even this really crazy one called a floor where the yeast actually float to the surface of their media. Um, and these phenotypes are really quite charismatic, I think. If you look across uh, wild isolates of yeast, um, you can find a really incredible diversity in just how they look when they're growing um, uh, as colonies and how they look in liquid media and how they look under a microscope. Um, and so it's kind of been on uh, uh, my mind and a bunch of other people um, in our group's mind of thinking about ways to select on these phenotypes. Um, and in fact, there's already a, a couple really cool biofilm um, stickiness related uh, lab activities that exist, um, including one from um, uh, Von Cooper's group at uh, Pittsburgh selecting for uh, biofilmy bacteria and one from Will Ratcliffe's group at Georgia Tech that selects for um, uh, yeast settling and liquid culture. Um, so I think it, it'd be it, it kind of an interesting set of phenotypes to think about um, selecting for, um, particularly in a classroom context, since you've got this great visual feedback. Um, Additionally, uh, control of these phenotypes is one of the most complicated things that yeast do. So this is a, an overwhelming figure, um, but just to walk through it quickly, uh, this red bar in the middle is the promoter of a, one of these sticky genes called FLO11. Um, the flocculin fa family of genes are some of the key players in yeast adhesion. Um, and all of these little blue circles are different transcription factors that regulate the expression of this gene. 
And if you follow those up to the top, they're regulated by a ton of different nutrient sensing pathways and other environmental pa sensing pathways like um, uh, what the pH is and whether another yeast is sending off a pheromone. So this leads to uh, the expression of these genes being a really complex decision-making process based on the environment that a particular yeast finds itself in. Uh, and a crazy phenomenon that results from that is that based on um, kind of micro environments within a, an individual yeast colony, you can get different gene expression patterns um, based on what uh, just where that cell happens to end up within the colony. So this is a, a figure from a group that used uh, some really incredible um, uh, ways to monitor gene expression in different segments of a colony and find that in these um, biofilmy colonies in particular, there's, there's a really intricate structure to um, how different genes are expressed in different parts of the colony, um, which kind of looks a whole heck of a lot like uh, uh, basic developmental programs in multicellular organisms. So it's kind of just an, an interesting process um, thinking about how these gene regulatory networks have evolved and why they've evolved this way um, and how we can use uh, laboratory evolution to study how these types of patterns can be perturbed. So Margot Walson uh, had this really interesting idea to um, develop a couple different um, uh, selection schemes for different adhesion related phenotypes um, with the ultimate goal of developing some classroom activities that we could implement um, uh, based on uh, these really striking visual phenotypes. So one approach she took was to select for um, glass adhesion, uh, it manifests itself in what we refer to colloquially as a bathtub ring. It's this kind of fuzzy middle space um, where the yeast are adhering to the glass at the air media interface. Um, but the part I'm gonna focus on is a selection for invasive growth. So uh, this top um, image is a plate where Margot um, spotted out some yeast and let them grow for about a week. Um, at the end of that time, uh, she poured some water on the plate and just wiped the yeast away. Um, you can do this either with a finger or a gloved finger or a, a cell spreader. Um, and what you're left with are just the yeast that either stuck strongly to the media or that actually dug into it. Um, she would take one of these plates and this was a, a process that is a lot of science. It's a lot of work for her to get it started, but now it looks really easy um, that she got it worked out. Um, you look at the invasive ring um, that this colony left behind and she would pick a spot that was particularly dense and use a pipette tip to just dig out a core sample of cells, inoculate that into media and then plate it. Uh, let it grow for a few days, wash and repeat. After four weeks of selection on this invasion phenotype, she started to see some um, divergence in the phenotypes of her different replicates. So on the left is that ancestor, these right three columns are different replicates she carried out. And you can already see four weeks in, you're getting a bit of a biofilmy appearance at the top, a bit of a, a structure to the edges of the colonies in some of these replicates. Um, and some of the invasion patterns that you see a little more digging in the middle of the plate, thicker rings, different um, patterning to the outside. Um, to make sure that this wasn't just some variability in um, uh, the protocol week to week, uh, we did some sequencing and uh, kind of had a, a good aha or a good, uh, okay, it seems like it's working moment when we found um, that one of these replicates had a, a mutation in a gene called IRA2, which is one of the most well characterized uh, negative regulators of these invasion phenotypes. Um, so this was a good check, sanity check to make sure we should keep going. Um, just to zoom in on these two replicates, um, you can already see like this left one's got these kind of spokes coming out. Uh, the right one's got a speckled pattern. Um, so it's clear that based on the environment that these are uh, cells are finding themselves and they're making different decisions about whether to invade or not. So she kept this going for seven weeks, um, isolated a bunch of clones and uh, did some um, uh, phenotypic characterization of them. Um, this top set uh, numbers represent the replicate they came from, and then letters are individual clones. 
Um, and you can see a, a pretty wide diversity of both colony level phenotypes and then invasion patterns at seven weeks. Um, her glass adhesion experiments also produced a fair bit of variation, which makes sense since um, all these stickiness genes have, have some regulation, uh, regulatory elements in common. And I just want to zoom in on a couple of these um, lineages. So on the left are uh, two clones from lineage one. On the right are two clones from lineage C. Uh, these are from the same evolving lineage, which we can tell because they share mutations in IRA2, um, that same gene that, that came up before. Um, but they're showing different phenotypes, which suggests there's something else at the genetic level that's modifying this phenotype um, beyond the effect of the IRA2 mutation. So if I add in um, the additional mutations that we detected in these strains, uh, the lineage one clones, there's one mutation that distinguishes them in a gene called OM45. It's an uncharacterized mitochondrial gene. Um, so uh, it could be a fun candidate to follow up on. Um, and then on the right, things are much more complicated, many more mutations. Uh, but one I'm excited about is MOT3. It's got an early stop, which seems significant, and it's a, a transcriptional repressor that's mod that uh, senses oxygen and uh, osmo osmolarity. Um, so it has to do with environmental sensing. So that'll be a fun one to follow up on. Um, we also see some other adhesion-related phenotypes, like this settling phenotype. Um, a bunch of replicates, uh, the yeast just settles straight to the bottom when you take the tubes out of a roller drum. Um, these have mutations that, uh, again, are, are pretty well characterized. The IRA2 is a known regulator. Uh, SFL1 is downstream of IRA2, so that one kind of makes sense. Um, I wanted to just show a couple fun videos, uh, or fun to me at least, of um, the variation in these phenotypes. Um, this one on the right in particular is kind of crazy. It's like a snow globe where uh, with just one giant chunk at the end. Um, so this project is still pretty early. This is where it stands at the moment. And I'm kind of interested just to hear uh, what people think about our approach so far. Um, I'm uh, at least scheduled at the moment to teach a microbiology lab in the fall. So I'm kind of interested to see if I can sneak some replicates of this in as a, a sort of mini cure um, within that course. So I'd be interested to hear uh, people's thoughts, both from a, a scientific and a teaching standpoint on this. Um, so with that, I just want to thank everyone in my lab and everyone who's been involved in these projects. Um, it's been a lot of people uh, over the years and a really fun group to work with. Um, and with that, I'll just end with uh, my favorite yeast picture. So thanks. Thank you, that was a great talk. So we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you can type in the chat, or you could use the raise hand function, whatever works. Looks like we've got a quiet audience today. It's Friday. It's almost yeah. March. <laughs> it's almost March again. Mm -hmm. hey, hey, Bryce, I had a question. This is Jeff oh, Barrick. Yeah. I, I hey. might have missed it, but when sorry, when they're when they're evolved, when you are having the students evolve these, do you tell them exactly what to do in terms of transfers and things like that, an amount of stressor to add, you know, information like that, or do you let them choose that themselves, and that's part of the competition? Like yeah, so it, it's, you been, want um, it's, it's been a mix. It's been kind of on a per teacher basis. It is logistically um, uh, obviously extra work to have the students adding their own um, stressor, but uh, in some classes, uh, we like for the students to be making the decision about whether they're going to increase the dose or not. Um, uh, and that kind of it leads to kind of fun moments where um, students are really testing their strains and seeing like, can it get to the next level or not? Um, 
Sometimes it leads to frustration when they add too much and kill their yeast and have to go back a week. Um, we've had funny, funny anecdotes of uh, two students who knew they were going to be competing in the March Madness bracket. And so they were like sneakily reading each other's lab notebooks to see what they were up against. Um, so yeah, we definitely like the agent, the letting them make the choices, but um, uh, it's extra work on the teacher for that to happen. So leave it up to the teacher. Interesting. Oh, got a raised hand from Mike. So question for you, do you tell your students ahead of time what that environment is going to be? So I know for instance, um, Greg Lang, who is using uh, Vita Ed for his microbiology yeah. lab courses, runs a March Madness competition where he doesn't tell them exactly what that environment is going to be mm -hmm. that they're competing in. And it might change from one round to another. So there's this trade-off between do you evolve something that specializes in that environment or do you evolve something in a variety of different environments and see if a generalist is going to win out? Yeah, I love that idea. I um, At this point, we do tell them the environment. It's always been fixed by classroom. Um, and um, so, so everyone's basically working with the same stuff. Um, I do think it would be fun to do something maybe like a re like almost like a relay race, like uh, if each student kept multiple conditions going and you see like who gets the furthest uh, in both conditions or something like that. Um, one of the logistical challenges is um, just always the amount of time. We don't want to take too much time away from class. Um, so uh, yeah, there's some, there's some basic it limits on what we can do. Um, but I do think that idea of having like, like thinking about different, how this is going to affect different environments is super interesting. Any other questions? Well, if not, let's all thank Bryce again for a really cool talk. Yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> Hope you all uh, have a nice weekend. Yes. Happy Friday, everyone. We will see you all again in two weeks, and I will post this on our YouTube channel.